What we're going to talk about today is a very ancient and a very mysterious word, and I think an even more mysterious feeling or notion. Shalom. You guys heard the word shalom? Probably heard it, right? It's a very hard to understand word. I think it's a very hard to find and live out type of word. What we're going to be talking about today is how to be okay with God when all is not okay. And I don't know about you guys, and just this week, right, you think about yesterday, we celebrated the passing of Mary Grace, got Jeffrey Pierce still in the hospital. You look around the world, you're like, this is just not okay. Like, this, this is just not okay. There's things in our lives, there's things in the city, in our country, in the world, and we look around, we're like, how, God, how is this happening? And I know you tell me, God, to have joy and to have peace, but, but this is just not okay. How do I be okay? And I'm confident that shalom is the answer to that question. We're going to try to get at what this shalom thing means by looking at three tellings of the same story, okay? There's a story in the Bible called Jesus Calms the Storm, and it's so important. One, it's just important. You read it once, and you get the power of it, but it's so important that it was put in three different gospels. It's a big deal. Matthew 8, Mark 4, Luke 8 all tell a story of Jesus calming a storm. So we're going to get a chance to look at all three of those and see what we can add on and learn from about this idea of shalom from all three of those stories. We'll start in with Matthew, Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Matthew 8, 23, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Because that's what disciples do, right? They follow Jesus. Even into boats. How many of you love boats? Okay, good number. How many of you are afraid of boats or get uh, seasick? Right? Okay, so imagine back then. There's even more of that. There's something about boats, right? They're cool, they're powerful. A lot of the disciples were probably familiar with boats, but not all of them were. There's something about boats that are just a little bit unsteady. They're vulnerable. And here they get into this boat, unsure of their destination. Why? Because that's where Jesus was going. And that's what disciples do. And the same message applies to us. You just go where Jesus is going, even if it causes you to get into something that's uncomfortable and you're not sure where you're going. And when you do that, some stuff can happen, right? Matthew 8, 24, a windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. So they get into this boat, they're going with Jesus, and then this thing happened, a great windstorm. You have to understand this great windstorm. So first, the word here for windstorm is seismos. Seismos, that should sound familiar to you. It's like the ancient root of our word seismic, okay? It can be translated earthquake, a shaking, agitation, a tempest. I mean, that alone sounds rough in a boat, okay? Now add to that the word great. And great here isn't like very good, like, I had a great time. That's not this word, okay? The word is megas. It means great, large, or violent. Violent. The storm's enough. It's a huge, huge storm that they're experiencing. And they're told that the waves are hitting. That's why I love, I use this Rembrandt picture, this Rembrandt depiction of the storm. It covers over the boat, the word is calupto, conceal or hide or cover or bury. The waves are so big, they're actually covering over part of the boat. The disciples are freaked out, and they look back, and what's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. You guys ever know anyone who can sleep through, like, anything? And if they're sitting next to you, don't elbow them, okay? How do we feel about these people that can sleep through anything? They annoy us! Like, how could you possibly be asleep through this alarm, this earthquake, this phone call? Like, how could you possibly be asleep right now? And they look back, and Jesus is just snoozing during this huge, huge storm. Just picture this. We're going to keep talking about this as we go through it. In response to seeing Jesus calmly asleep, in Matthew 8, 25, we learn they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Now, this here is proof 
why Jesus is a lot better than us, right? If it were me, I'd be like, you got three seconds to tell me why you just woke me up. Because I was out, and I'm tired. i just been teaching, okay? But Jesus is better than this, right? Doesn't do this. But I always wonder what he would have been thinking with the words they said to him. They wake up and say, we're perishing. Jesus is a smart guy. The smartest. He's like, perishing? No, no one's perishing. You're all still in the boat. No one's out of the boat. We're, we're good, okay? You guys are good. You're not actually perishing. But he doesn't get sarcastic with them. He asks them a very, very, very important question. He said to them, why are you afraid? You of little faith. And he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there is a dead calm. Look at this question closely. Why are you afraid? You of little faith. Imagine Jesus asking you that question about your storm. Now, I don't know what the storm is for you guys. For many people, there's health storms. Some of the storms are relational, a relationship, or relationships you might be having with someone. It's just, it's just not right. It's not okay. For some of us, it's work. For some, it's not work. For some of it's just like I said, you look around at the world around you, like this is just this is just not okay, and we get afraid. And then Jesus says, "Just what? Why, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? You have little faith." Because Jesus is pointing out a really important connection between fear and faith, and it's this: fear is inversely correlated with faith, which is just a fancy way of saying as your fear goes up, your faith goes down. As your faith goes up, your fear goes down. They got a real legitimate storm. We just talked about it. And Jesus says, why are you afraid of it? I, I was asleep. And what he's saying to them is, if you're afraid, you are not trusting me enough that I'm going to get you through this. Where is your faith? This anxiety, this worry, this stress, this fear, the, why? Why don't you trust me? I'm with you. I'm in the boat. I was actually asleep. Where is your faith? Matthew 8, 27. In response to this, they were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. So I love that the disciples don't immediately respond, say, oh, Jesus, I'm really sorry we woke you up. Let's just let him go back to sleep, right? They don't say that. They don't say that. They don't apologize for their lack of faith. They don't apologize that they woke him up, but they are amazed. And they're amazed, and I love how Matthew puts it, they're amazed that the winds and the sea obey this man, but they don't. And I think that's why Matthew wrote it this way. Jesus gets up, he tells the winds and the sea to stop, they do that, and the disciples who were told to trust him and have faith in him and follow him didn't. First sign of trouble, first storm, they woke him up, freaked out. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm with you. It's going to be okay simply because I am in the boat with you. Do not be afraid. The winds and sea obey me. Maybe you guys should do that too. Let's look at Mark's account. Mark 4, 35 to 41. Mark the action gospel. Mark 4, 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. So Mark gives us this added detail that it's evening time, it's nighttime. All right, so now add that we've got a huge storm and it's not light. All right, so it's not calm, it's not light. This seems even scarier now. And Jesus is taking them somewhere and we're told that they go to the other side, which sounds exactly like what a trip with Jesus would do. Just to the other other side, just from where you are, someplace different. You might not know where you're going. And with Jesus, that's okay, because that's what he wants to do with us. He wants to take us from here to there, this side to that side, someplace different, someplace unknown, and on the way, you could have some scary stuff that happens. Mark 4, 36, and leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, other boats were with him. I love this. Leaving the crowd behind. It's exactly what Jesus Christ wants for us. To leave the crowd behind. Not do what everyone else is doing. 
Because when we follow Jesus, it's going to look different than that. It's going to look a little brighter than that. And that's what he wanted the disciples. I want you to leave the crowd behind. Something different is going to happen. Something better, something brighter, something special is going to happen. But we've got to leave that behind and go forward with him. And I love how Jesus gets into the boat. He's described as just as he was. I don't know about you guys, but if I got invited for a boat trip, okay, first I take my Dramamine, all right? Because I do, I get really seasick. And I probably change my clothes Probably think about what I need to pack. What's going to happen? Where are we going on the other side of this trip? But not Jesus. Just gets in the boat. Just as he was. No airs. Just Jesus. Because he's Jesus, which is more than good enough, right? So he just gets in the boat just as he was. Prepared for anything. And any of you wonder about the other boats? Am I the only one who's wondered about the other boats when this happened? What happened to the other boats? We focus on this one boat, the Jesus boat, which makes sense. It's Jesus, it's the disciples, but what about the other boats? Who's in them? What happened to them? Did they freak out? The more I read this story, the more I find myself in those other boats. I think we're in those other boats. And we're in the storm, or the storm's coming, or the storm has happened, and we're supposed to look at this boat and say, how are we supposed to handle this storm? Don't freak out. Remember, Jesus is with you. Don't freak out. Remember, Jesus is with you, even in the storm. Mark 4, 37, here's the storm again. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. All right, so now picture you got the disciples, right? They're sitting in the boat, and the boat is actually filling with water. It's not only covering the boat, it's inside the boat. They're watching the water inside the boat go up, and they've got a choice. They can watch the water, or they can look back and see Jesus asleep in the boat. It's a huge choice, folks. In the storm, what are you going to do? You're going to watch the water rise, or are you going to watch the Lord? Are you going to watch your challenge, your storm, your thing, whatever that is? Again, health, relationship, work, other, life in general. Are you going to watch that just get worse? Or are you going to watch the Lord? Are you going to pray to Him? Are you going to seek Him? Are you going to read His Word? Are you going to worship Him? Are you going to remember He is in the back of your boat? And He's so good with it, He's asleep. He's calm. That's shalom. But to do that, we've got to keep our eyes on the Lord and not the rising water. Mark 4, 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I love this illustration. I think it was a kid's illustration. But what I love about it, you notice how Jesus looks really comfortable? He's on a cushion. I always pictured him like asleep on like wood, right? These are pretty old school kind of boats. It says he's on a cushion. He looks comfortable. Would you want to wake that up? No. I don't wake Jesus up at all, let alone on a cushion. Like he is comfortable. And then they wake him up with a very obnoxious question. Say, Jesus, do you not care that we're perishing? They're saying this to Jesus. Of course Jesus cares. But the reality is, he might have wanted them to fall asleep on the same cushion in the back of the boat. He may want you to sleep through the storm too. He may want you to say, you know what? This is rough. Waves are high. Water's in the boat. Health's getting worse. Relationship isn't fixed. Don't have a job. Job's still bad. I'm just going to sleep. I'm going to rest. Because God's got this, because he does care. He cares so much, he might actually want you to sleep and rest and not toss and turn in the middle of the night, because he's God. He's got you covered, and he absolutely cares. Mark 4, 39. He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Gets up, speaks to the wind. Right, just think of like Jesus versus wind. 
right? The incredible force that is the wind, the thing we can't predict, the thing that topples buildings. And Jesus uses this word epitomao, and it means rebuke or reprove, warn or threaten. It's Jesus, this guy that they've just met, right? And he looks at the wind, he's like, no, 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 listen to me. Like, you better stop this. That's what a warning, that's what a threatening is. And the wind listens. Then he says to the sea, peace, be still. Shalom, be still. But what's fascinating to me is that Jesus says this to the sea, not to the disciples. Right? He could have gotten and been like, you guys need to chill out. I was asleep, and none of you have made coffee. <laughs> right? Like, seriously, calm down. But he doesn't. He actually takes care of the thing they're afraid of. Even though he told them, don't be afraid. He says, all right, you're concerned about the wind, you're concerned about the sea, I'll take care of that. But then he asks them that challenging, challenging question, right, about fear and faith. But I want you to notice the contrast here between a great storm, a mega storm, all of a sudden becomes a great calm. This word here for dead is just great. Two extremes. Huge storm, huge calm. All because of Jesus. Not because of how well the disciples handled the boat, not their maneuvers, not their strategy, their planning, their plan A, their plan B, their meetings, none of that. All because of Jesus. And so if you guys are in that stormy period and you're like, I, I don't know what else to do. I've tried everything. You might be right. There might be nothing else you can do. Might just need to go to sleep, rest, knowing that he's got this. Because when we turn over those storms to Jesus, he takes care of them. Sometimes quickly, sometimes not so quickly. <laughs> but he's on it. He's in that boat with you if you look at him and remember he's there. And he's the only one that can take that great storm and make it something very, very calm. And he might ask you a question or two. Mark 4.40, he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Again, he's pointing out that your fear reveals your faith. Why are you guys afraid? Why'd you wake me up? And he presumes, is it because you guys still don't have a lot of faith? Because again, that's what fear is. Your level of fear reveals your level of faith. The more afraid you are, the less faith you have. And vice versa. The more faithful you are, the less fear you have because you know it might be hard. The storm's real. But you know God's got it. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to worry. You don't need to have anxiety because Jesus is in your boat and he is going to take care of it. Your fear reveals your faith. Mark 4, 41. And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So again here, no apology, no sorry, Jesus. They are really, really scared. And your Bibles often say here that um, they have great awe. They're filled with great awe. I want you to see the literal translation of where the disciples were, because this is huge. Okay, in Greek, the way the disciples felt was this. Ephobethesan, phobon, megon. I'm going to translate that literally. Afraid with great terror. Now, you could just use the word ephobethason. It just means they're afraid. The disciples were afraid. But that's not what he said. He could have said ephobethason phobon, so they're afraid with terror. That's not what he said. Ephobethason phobon megon. There's that megon word again. Great, great fear. They are scared out of their heads, out of their minds. Because of the storm? No, don't miss this. They are scared out of their minds because they just watched this man calm the storm. They just watched this, this guy, this person, take their biggest fear and make it nothing. So they are afraid with great terror. And you have this incredible biblical example of what a fear of the Lord looks like. God is so good. He is so powerful. He takes great storms and makes them great calm. And if I had seen that, I'd probably find that cushion and just rest. 
Because you're like, he, he's got it covered. This is a remarkable fear of the Lord that's being displayed by these disciples. Finally. Luke 8, 22 to 25. One day, he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out. All right, so this word here to describe going from one side of the lake to the other is anago. Anago, and you need to see that this is a descriptive word. Anago means to movement from a lower point to a higher point. All right, so from down here to up here. As they go across the lake, Jesus is actually taking them higher. This is what happens if you follow Jesus. He's taking you from down here to up here, even though, and we know how the story's going to go, right? You've read it twice now. It'd be a great storm. Great storm. Let Jesus use your lows to take you higher. Let Jesus use this storm to take you from down here to up here. Not because it's comfortable, not because it's all good, not because it's all pleasant, but because he's in the boat with you and he's going to use this to take you from down here to up here if you go with him and you remember he's with you and you're not afraid. That's shalom. Now, this gives me an opportunity, shameless plug, okay? When we start up the bridge again, which you know, guys, we do here in the fall, we do it in the spring, uh, we are going to be doing a class. I'm going to be teaching a class on discipleship. And we are going to be going on this voyage with Jesus, and we're going to take a look specifically at the Gospel of Luke in fall and spring, and we're going to look at Jesus, every interaction with the disciples, every one of them, what he taught them, what they got, what they didn't get. And we are going to disciple. And notice I say we, because I'm going to have to be discipled. And we're going to do this in a group, and it is going to be awesome. You're going to hear more about this as we tell you about the bridge. It's going to start up next month. But I want to encourage you, if you are new to the faith, you want to be in this. Or if you're not and you're serious about this, going from down here to up here, join us as we look at what happens with Jesus' interaction with the disciples and the fun that they have when they're on this journey, when they were on this discipleship. Luke 8, 23. While they were sailing, he fell asleep. Windstorms swept down the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. This word, danger. We hear this word, and we probably see something like this, right? It's got to be in red. Like, oh no, it's dangerous. Don't touch it. Don't go near it. Don't do it. But let's remember what danger means, folks. This is the dictionary definition of the word danger. It is the possibility of suffering harm or injury. It's the possibility of something unwelcome or unpleasant. Danger doesn't mean harm. Danger does not mean this is going to hurt. It means it might. But guess what? He's still in the back of the boat with you. And it is going to be okay. He wants us to get ourselves into situations that are challenging and tough. And he is with us. And he's going to carry us. And he is going to use us. Even in the midst of the storm. That's shalom. News flash. Life is not safe. It's not. As hard as we try to make it. Think about it. How could something that you only get out of by dying be safe? Not possible, right? Life is hard. It's challenging. It is dangerous. And I don't know about you, but I didn't get a choice to show up in it. I'm here, okay? Parents made that choice. woo And we're here now. There's probably a reason for that, for me and for you. And it's going to be dangerous, and it's going to be challenging, and it's going to have storms, and it's going to have some lows. But if you remember he's with you, there's shalom. There is shalom. Luke 8, 24. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was a calm. So again, they wake him up. They're freaking out. And they use this word again. We are perishing. That means we are dying. And Jesus has got to be like, Sit, you guys aren't dying. You're not even drowning. Like last time I checked, you're all still in the boat. There's no hole in the boat. 
I get we're seeing some water, but no one's dying here. You are uncomfortable. That's what you should have said. Should have woken up and said, Jesus, we're like uncomfortable. <laughs> right? I guess they wanted to wake him up. But just because you're uncomfortable doesn't mean Jesus isn't with you. Just because you are uncomfortable does not mean he is not with you in the back of the boat. And he might be asleep. He might be so confident that you're going to be able to get through this. He's like, I'm just going to sleep on this one. I'm going to go to sleep. You guys are good. You're not going to die. You're going to be okay. I've got you on this one. He says to them, Luke 8, 25, where is your faith? There's the question again. They were afraid and amazed and said to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. Ask him the faith question that he makes everything calm. This word here for calm is a really significant word. It's galene. Galene means calm or tranquil stillness on the surface of a body of water. Think about this for a second. A lake that is completely and totally still. Think about water, the property of water, and how unstill it is. Right? And yet how often we see pictures like this, this beautiful picture. I think this is a a river in Maine. And you look at it and you're like, that is completely still. I want to go there. Right? Okay, I want to give you a trick. I'm going to give you a photographer's trick on how this happens. I can almost guarantee you the person who took this picture was not holding the camera. Okay? They had to make sure that camera was still. And because water is moving, they probably had that on a tripod. And they had to lengthen the shutter speed to make it look like the water is still. And it makes for gorgeous pictures. Right? We do it with rivers. We do it with waterfalls. But if you look closely at the water, it looks like that. Right? Ripples. Movement. That's what water does. That's what makes it so powerful. That's why when Jesus talked in the New Testament about that living water, that's why it's such a great idea. Water moves. And yet in this situation, Jesus makes that water completely still. That would freak me out too. Because water doesn't usually do still. But it happened because Jesus made it happen. Life isn't safe, and it's not calm. It is only calm with Jesus. We might want it to look like that picture, just totally serene. But it's only that way when Jesus gets involved. It's only that way when we go with what God actually tells us to do in his word. It's the only thing that can make it calm, make it still. And that's his shalom. So the standard definition of shalom, right, means completeness, soundness, welfare, or what it's often translated as is peace. Peace. Peace works. It's an accurate translation, but you have to understand, yes, it means peace, but it doesn't necessarily mean a lack of conflict. Shalom isn't that everything is perfect. Shalom is I'm perfect even in the midst of the imperfect because I've got Jesus in my boat. This is what I think makes it such a common Jewish greeting. Jews today still greet each other with this incredible greeting. When they say hi, when they say goodbye, they say shalom. We wish you shalom, that you be complete, that you be sound, even when everything is unsound, that you be at peace, even though things aren't peaceful. That's shalom. That's why this word is such an important word biblically. It shows up 267 times just in the Old Testament alone. Shows up in the New Testament, different word, right? 85 times, that word is erene, same idea, shalom. Completeness, soundness, wholeness, even when things are not. Simply because we know we got you know who in the back of the boat with us. When you think shalom, you gotta think of God. And when I say God, I'm talking the big three here, all right? God is literally described as a God of peace, a God of shalom in Judges 6.24. Or the famous description, prophecy of the coming of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. That's the Prince of Shalom. Jesus is the Prince of Shalom. The Holy Spirit is described as a spirit of peace, a spirit of arene in Romans 8, 6. When you think about God, you've got to think Shalom. And when you think about Shalom, you've got to think about God. We're going to look at one more verse that I think gives us a really vivid description of what Shalom looks like and how we can put it to use in our lives. Isaiah 54, 10. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, 
And thy covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. So there's the verse. I'm going to kind of break it down elementally. Mountains made apart and hills be removed. What, what are mountains? What are hills? They're beautiful things, right? We love to photograph them. We love to see them. We love to, in some cases, climb them and get over them. But one of the things that mountains are are points of reference, especially back then at this point in time. Right? If you were to go out in the middle of this valley, we got a clear view, and you looked inside these mountains on this side and these mountains on this side, you could tell very quickly what direction is east and west because your points of reference are there. Then this verse, Isaiah 54, 10 says, when your points of reference disappear, when everything you had hoped for is gone, when what you counted on, planned for, and predicted is gone, God's steadfast love, not gone. God's covenant of peace, his shalom, not gone. Even though things didn't turn out the way we planned them to be, all of the mountains, all the hills, all the points of reference, why didn't it go the way I wanted to, God? God's like, hey, I'm still here. I'm in the back of the boat, and I love you a lot, and that's not stopping. And by the way, you can be at peace with this too. That's my covenant of shalom, and he's made that with you, and he's made that with me. Why would he do that? Even though we wake him up, because of his compassion. Isaiah 54, 10, he says he does that because of his compassion. And as we take communion this morning, I want you to think about it as his compassion. His compassion lived out on the cross for you and for me. Because the reality is that Jesus has already calmed the ultimate storm. It's done. We don't need to wake him up. He has already calmed that storm for you and for me. And that's why I think John 16, 33 says this. I've said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. There's that word. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Let's pray and take communion this morning. God, we thank you for conquering the world for us. The whole thing. It's billions of people. It's challenges. It's imperfections. You have got it right where you want it. Even though we don't. And we thank you for this reminder today that you are in the back of our boat. You're with us. You love us. Even in our storms. Maybe even especially in our storms. And you want us to be calm. To have peace. To not be afraid. And prove to you that we have great faith in you because you've got us covered. Whatever that storm may be. And you proved your love for us with what you did on that cross so long ago. And we remember that now as we take communion. As we take the bread, we remember the body of Jesus Christ broken for all of us. As we take the cup, we remember the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for us. What a storm that must have been. We thank you, we love you, and it's in your son's name we do this and pray. Amen.